Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this evening, for the time of worship. And Lord, I pray that we would continue worshiping you, Lord, as we open your word and hear what it is you have to say to us tonight, Lord. I pray that you would just direct our thinking and touch our hearts as we just sang, Lord. We, are, we love your presence, Lord. So, Lord, be blessed in our presence tonight. We look into the things that you have for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. So last week, I mentioned that these last four chapters of 2 Samuel, and we did the first two of those four chapters, um, are really an appendix to the entire book. And so they don't, they don't fall in chronological order, they're just things that were added on that happened along the way of the stories that we've already taken into account. Um, as we open up this chapter tonight, we can imagine that at least this, um, several of these first verses of this chapter were definitely towards the end um, of the stories that we've read. And you'll see what I'm talking about in a moment. Um, but just remember, we're still in that. I thought for sure when I started studying that we would finish these last two chapters tonight, but... These first seven verses of this chapter are just too rich for us to move through too quickly. We'll probably finish up 2 Samuel next week, but I'm not promising. Let's just begin verse 1. It says, Now these are the last words of David. Thus says David the son of Jesse. Thus says the man raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel. The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. And he shall be like the lightning, light of the morning when the sun rises, the morning without clouds, like the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. So we start off by hearing this is the Final words, low flipper. Um, final words of David, but this isn't the final words in the sense that the words that are spoken to from David's deathbed. And uh, just for the sake of the videotape, someone's going to go, why did he just say hello flipper? Because they didn't hear what I just heard. That was a phone that went off, let you know, on tape. Um, but I think that guy's loony. Um, but this isn't the final words as far as David being on his deathbed. Um, they're simply words that David expressed um, towards the end of his life as he looked back. And let's take a look at what he said here about himself. And as much as I say that he said this about himself, we must realize that we're reading scripture. And so we're reading something that's been influenced, really penned through the very hand of man by the Holy Spirit. And so David may have said these things about himself, but he said it under the leading of the Spirit who revealed these things to him. So it's not him being prideful in any sense. But he begins off about himself. He says he's the son of Jesse. And Jesse, we remember, was just a humble man, his father. And it's that title that David gives here that really shows how humble David really was, in a sense, amongst the other characteristics of him that we know. He was still humble. He was still that shepherd boy not even thought well enough to come in with his other brothers to be shown off, if you remember, to Samuel. And then the next thing he says of himself is he's the man raised up on high. And it was God that raised David up so that he could confidently rest in that title. That's not a place that David put himself. As a matter of fact, you consider how long David ran from Saul, how many different ways that, that he endured years before he got the very throne that he was promised. The next thing he says of himself is he's the anointed of the God of Jacob. And David was anointed by God, but not by himself, not by any man. It was directly an anointing put upon. And that, that word's so strong, that word being anointed of God. And it's something we all need to seek when we move into whatever ministry God has for us, that we would have the anointing of God. Because that's him putting his power, his mark, his signature, if you will, upon us as we do what he's asked us to do. So he was uniquely empowered by God, enabled by God. And then I think one of the most beautiful titles that David carries about himself 
He was the sweet psalmist of Israel. And, and we read through the Psalms, and I hope you have read through the Psalms. Um, David was beautifully gifted, um, eloquent in his expression before God. I mean, he was a musician, he was a songwriter. We know that he invented instruments. I mean, David was a very special in that way. And we see the softness of his heart as he writes those poems, as he writes those songs. Um, and then I like it even more when I consider that David was a man of war. David was a man of war. He was a giant killer. And he led men, mighty men, hundreds, and then later thousands and tens of thousands of mighty men. But just that softness in his heart for that place that God occupied there. So it really kind of reminds us of David's deep inner life with God. And thankfully he had that. Because as we know, so much of his outer life was stained. And you know, we all go through those times. Our outer life doesn't really you know, reflect maybe the things we wished it did. And yet in our heart we're soft for the things of God. I believe God sees that. I know he does because the word says he knows the heart of all men. So I'm glad that he sees the inside and there's something good there to see. Because he sees it when it's bad too. The next thing he says about himself is the spirit of the Lord spoke to me. And that really illustrates that there were times that David was aware of the work of divine inspiration through him and expressed by his words. Now, I don't believe that speaking of God that he heard always came in an audible way. And I don't know how many, if any of you, have ever heard from God audibly. Not many people have. There are people that claim to. I can't say I've ever heard him audibly, but yet I've heard his voice. I've heard him talk to me. I've heard, I've heard him in my heart. I've heard him in my mind. Um, but I don't know if I've ever had a thundering voice from God. But David definitely sensed that voice, that still small voice that was speaking to him. And think how many times that he went to the priests. And he said, inquire of the Lord for me. So, I mean, he, he, went, he went and had people intercede for him as well because he was hungry to hear what God had to say. I think that's another great example for us. God will speak. And most often, for most of us, it's right here in that word that you got on your lap. That's where he speaks. Not that he won't speak through another believer. Not that he won't. He may use something completely secular, non-spiritual, if there is any such thing. Um, to, to speak. It, the word of God comes in many ways. His instruction comes from many ways. I mean, let's face it. He says that nature declares his majesty. And really that none have an excuse. Paul goes as far as that in Romans. None have an excuse to say they don't know him. Or there's no evidence of him. Because really all of nature around us speaks. The next thing he says is, he who rules over men must be just. And so there's a lesson that he learned. There, there was something that came into his life, um, and there was evidence that this was true. And you think about how many times we saw David do things that maybe we were surprised by, because we judged it by maybe our own flesh, or by the flesh of other leaders that we've seen, or, or just what we think would probably be the more acceptable thing for him to do. And yet he was trying to be just in his leadership. So he, he somewhere along the way concluded there's a great need for rulers to exercise justice, man. Could we use that today? I mean, if the leaders of the world could know that that's actually what they're to execute, um, things would be a whole lot different. But he knew this because he had witnessed the goodness of justice provided and the curse of justice denied. I was just, just read yesterday or this morning about a, a guy just uh, 23 years he's been in jail for a double murder they finally figured out he didn't do and I think about the injustice of something like that and that's just an example we could spend the rest of the night brainstorming injustices but I did, that one's always got me when I've seen those cases to know to sit in that cell for 23 years and yeah, he won like a million and a half dollars. So what? 23 years. You know, but this world is full of injustice because it's a fallen place. You know, and, and we know that Satan's the god of this world, small g, and um, it's going to be that way until God comes to rule and reign as he sits on the 
throne in Jerusalem someday. We can all wait for that day. And then he said, he shall be like the light of the morning. Another great descriptor. David reflected on how a wise ruler is blessed and blesses others when he rules with justice. He becomes a light. He becomes a light to others because people can see him as that just person, usually in a system that has no justice at all. And so he stood out with that part of his leadership. Now, as we conclude this study, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, and as I said all the way back at the beginning of 1 Samuel, in the original scripture, there was no first and second. This was just the book of Samuel. But we studied it as it's been given to us, first and second. But as we conclude this study, it's easy to see that David's reign as king was far from perfect. I don't think anybody would argue with that. And really, depending on your perspective, you could have the opinion that David's reign was a disaster. I mean, he suffered from a dark scandal during his reign. He suffered under repeated family crises, which he really brought about. He suffered an attempted insurrection from his own son, and really it was more than attempted, it was almost successful. And he suffered under a civil war, and then for three years of famine. An interesting in contrast to David, his son Solomon, who follows him, reigns as a king with seeming perfection. Very odd that, that David had all these challenges and made all these decisions, and then his son comes on, and, and he reigns as a king with, with seeming perfection. And Solomon enjoyed a reign of peace, great prosperity, prominence, glory. But when you look at the scriptures, remember, the scriptures are what God directs. It's not so much how we interpret what happened to this man or that man. It's what we see in Scripture about these men. Because when you look at Scripture, David's reign is praised by God. I want to just look at some of those areas. Psalm 89, verse 20. It's God speaking. And he says, I have found my servant David. With my holy oil I have anointed him. And that doesn't mean David was lost and God's like, oh, finally, there you are. No, it says that he found him in the sense this was a man he was looking for, to anoint. And how special a relationship that God would seek a man, an individual man, to anoint. And he calls him my servant. That's an honor. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 3, it says, Incline your ear and come to me. Here in your souls shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. Indeed, I have given him, David, as a witness to the people, a leader and a commander for the people. And so there's God testifying of what he gave David to be for the people, which he's putting a stamp on David. He's calling David his witness, as he just did a moment ago, calling him his servant. He's saying this is a leader and a commander of people. I mean, that's, you can't get much better... Um, accolades them from God himself in Romans chapter 1 verse 3 it says concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh I don't know how much better of a seat you want in history than knowing that the Lord was your direct descendant and to know that that promise was given to you and you heard that that would come someday and you sometime can go and read in Matthew chapter 1 the genealogy. And he's, David's mentioned twice at the very beginning of the genealogy and like six verses later maybe. Um, David's mentioned in that genealogy because the, in, of the flesh, the Savior comes from his lineage. And then finally, from Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, the very last chapter of the Bible, Jesus himself speaking. And he says, I, Jesus have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Right there, at the culmination of, of, of biblical time, Jesus mentions David, that I came from him in the flesh. But what, I mean, I don't think you can have much more that you'd want said of you. But then in contrast, there's Solomon. And he's barely mentioned in the rest of the scriptures. And where he is mentioned, it's almost insulting. 
And I want to make this contrast because we see David, the blessed of the Lord, a man after God's own heart, going through all these trials, and yet God has anointed him and has used him and, and, and comes from him as far as his, his, his humanity. And yet there's this Solomon who just seems like can't do no wrong and his life is good. And yet scripture, God's word, doesn't really illustrate that. Listen from Matthew chapter 6, verse 28 and 9. Jesus, again speaking, he says, So why do, you, why do you worry about clothing? You might remember this conversation. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. And then again in Matthew chapter 12, verse 42, it says, The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. Jesus speaking of himself. Now, the most important difference, and this is the point I'm driving us toward, between David and Solomon was found in their different relationships with God. And that's what we need to hear. Because it's really not about us, in case you didn't know. It's really about him. And when we realize that, then we must realize that then all that really matters as far as I'm concerned is what my relationship with him is. David's passion in life was simply to be with God. From Psalm 84, verse 10, it says, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. We sing that worship song. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. That's the difference between David and Solomon. It needs to be the difference with us and every non-believer and maybe every other believer. Because really, when it comes to our life in Christ, it's about what we do with that and how we relate to it and how hard we work on that relationship. With it, how much we really do seek his presence as we just sung a moment ago and love it as we sang a moment ago. Now, I, I want to read, this is kind of a lengthy portion, but I want to read it because in contrast, Solomon's passion was for personal improvement. And I think it's so important on a couple reasons for us to analyze what he asked for. Because the world would ask us to ask like Solomon. The Lord would make, I mean, the world would make this our prior, priority in life. It would be self-improvement. It would be self-aggrandizing. It would be something good for us and I'm not saying we shouldn't seek good things. I think we have an excellent God. God expects excellence from his people. And so I'm not saying that we shouldn't want good things. I'm not saying we shouldn't, you know, live a good life. I'm just saying where should that start? What should our priorities be? But I also want you to notice as I read these verses, not only what Solomon asked for, but how God related to what he didn't ask. Because that's another lesson. For us. If we seek heaven first, God says he'll add all the other things to us. And if we know that our treasure is in heaven, then we don't have to worry about the things that we do on earth being things that will be burned up later and rust. And so notice how he seeks what is in his heart. God honors it. But because he honors that, then he gives him the, the greater gifts. But then there will be other lessons in here as well. You can, if you want to jump one book over to 1 Kings chapter 3, you can follow with me. Not that far to your right. 1 Kings chapter 3, beginning in verse 4. It says, Now the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there. For that was the great high place. Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask, what shall I give you? And Solomon said, You have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him. And you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. 
Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father, David, but I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or to come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to judge this great people of yours? The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Then God said to him, Because you have asked this thing, and have not asked long life for yourself, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice, behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart, so that there has not been anyone like you before, nor shall any like you arise after you. And I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings all your days. So if you walk in my ways, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And Solomon awoke, and indeed it had been a dream, and he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, offered up burnt offerings, offered peace offerings, and made a feast for all his servants. So you notice what he asked for. He asked for very little, but he asked for something very important. And he asked for discernment, to be able to judge the people, to know good and evil. And it pleased him, pleased the Lord, because he didn't ask for anything else that most people would have asked for. And so he sought something purposeful and smaller And then God added everything else that he had in store for him. And so again, I think that's a great lesson for us to be very careful how we ask, but to make sure we ask. And know that often God will give us the desires of our heart, but we need to weigh them sometimes. Why do we want those things? What are we trying to achieve? Is this part of what God's leading us into? Is this his inspiration in me to want this? Or is it just what the world has asked me to go after? But notice verse 14. The Lord says, so if you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And we find out later that really this isn't what, this isn't what he did. This isn't what Solomon pursued. He really just pursued more and more of what he had, more and more of what God had given him. Now, we can also say that David endured to the end, loving and serving God in the final chapters of his life. We're seeing this in these first seven verses of this chapter. But Solomon forsook God in his later years. Here's the other contrast. Here's where David continued on, and this is where Solomon went the wrong way. Another great lesson for us. I'm going to read this from 1 Kings chapter 11, beginning in verse 4. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods and his heart was not loyal to the lord his god as was the heart of his father i'm just going to pause there for a moment one of the reasons for this in my estimation is because he drowned himself in worldly things including what 700 concubines i don't think i need to discuss that pick up in verse five there for solomon went after ashtoreth the goddess of the sidonians And after Milcom, the abominations of the Ammonites, Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord as did his father David. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. And he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Sad that he did not follow and so I, I just think it's a great contrast for us you know because we're not always going to get it right but what we need to get right is that our heart is for God and that when we don't get it right our heart is to return to him each and every time the desire to do right we, we may not but God valued in David that he desired to do right he saw something special in Solomon too And I believe because he blessed David, he blessed his son. But he didn't remain obedient. He remained loyal. 
And he went after foreign gods. And he filled up his life with the things of the world. The things he didn't ask for. That God graced him with. Are the very things that he went after. Not what God gave him particularly. Although he did use that too. And many from the world sought it out. <clears throat> now, beginning with verse 5. Back in our text, 2 Samuel 23. Beginning with verse 5, David speaks of his trust in God's covenant. Remember, God made a covenant with David. Beginning verse 5, Although my house is not so with God, yet he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. For this is all my salvation and all my desire. Will he not make it increase? But the sons of rebellion shall all be as thorns thrust away, because they cannot be taken with hands. But the man who touches them must be armed with iron and the shaft of, sp of a spear, and they shall be utterly burned with fire in their place. So David considered the entirety of his time as king. And he observed the great blessings upon a just ruler's reign, and he knew that his reign fell short of both perfect justice and complete blessedness. And he reflects on this and then makes note of God's faithfulness and God's grace with him regardless. And he says there, yet he has made with me an everlasting covenant. David knew that the everlasting covenant from God was not based on David's perfection as a ruler. Just like our relationship and whatever calling he has on us, it's not about our perfection. It's about his perfection. And it was based on God's gracious commitment to his everlasting covenant. God honors his word. And then David continues his statement. He says, this is all my salvation and all my desire. Now, David only said this because the covenant was based on God's faithfulness, not his own. And he knew that his own obedience was not enough to be a foundation for all his salvation or all his desires. We can see that David's sin and its consequences dimmed his light towards the end of his life, but it was not extinguished. And although it was limited, he still shined until the end. I saw this quote by an old-time commentator. He said, in God's dealing with us, there is no mistake, no lapse. Nothing has been permitted which has not been made to serve the highest purpose. This is so even in our failures. If, like David, in true penitence we have forsaken them and confessed them, it is certainly so of all our sorrows and trials. And notice what he said there. It's so even in our failures. If, like David, in true penitence we have forsaken them and confessed them. Penitence, speaking of repentance. Confession, which goes hand in hand with repentance. And that was the key with David. We talked about it all the way through these two books. It was the key with David. As he always had a heart after God. Now when he was going in a wrong direction, when he was making a bad decision, he didn't have God on his mind, let alone in his heart. He was just moving ahead in his flesh like we all do. And yet it's about what he did in response to his mistake. Even facing the consequence of his sin, it's what he did because he loved God. And if we love God, we're always going to turn back to him. The only thing that would truly stop that is if, well, if our love for God isn't genuine. Or two, if the enemy gets to us first. And that's often what causes us not to repent. Because he heaps upon us all the guilt and condemnation. He makes us think that we can't come back to the altar. At least not for a while. At least not till we do something else to please God or hide from him or whatever we choose to do. But we see in David's life that's not how God operates. God says, bring me your repentant heart. Confess what I already know. And again, that word confession just means to agree. Agree with God. That was wrong. That wasn't right. It was a sin. Tell him what he already knows, but that brings your heart in line with his. Then you turn and you repent which really truly means at its core, change your mind. Change your mind. Most sin begins there, and our way out of it is to work from there as well. Change your mind. Go in a different direction. What is that different direction? Back towards God. And your whole life follows. Let's consider a couple verses about repentance. 
book of Acts chapter 3 verse 19 it says repent therefore and be converted that your sin may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord now that was speaking to people that really were turning from a life of sin and not following God into a life following God basically getting saved and yet it still stands true for any of us that are already said saved repent and be converted and you're not being converted in the sense of being saved again but you're definitely being converted from that that moment of sin into a moment of righteousness before the Lord and then God has already done his work on the cross he's blotted out those things and then look at the promise there and this is what I want us to capture is that then comes times of refreshing that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord where's the refreshing come from the presence of the Lord why is that so important because I sinned I repented I'm now back in the presence of the Lord I'm, I've, I've dealt with my, my separation because of the sin. I'm refreshed. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, praise God, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There again, we could look at that as non-believers, becoming believers. But I don't think he wants us to perish even as believers. Perish how? In our sin to remain in our sin for whatever reason because one, we enjoy it too much two, we're just too guilty to go back to God too shamed he doesn't want any of that to keep us from him but man, I'm so thankful that he's long-suffering towards us that he's patient with us. Hmm. Romans chapter 2, verse 4 do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? You know, I think that's a hard one for some people to accept. I mean, for some of us, and let's be honest, you don't need to raise your hand, but for some of us, it'd just be easier if God slapped us upside the head and said, come back. Come here. Like we do as parents. Come here. Talk to you. He doesn't do that. It's his kindness that leads to repentance. And I've had the experience of knowing people that don't deal well with kindness. They maybe grew up in a harsh environment, and it's just easier to understand harshness. I had a gal that worked for me. who's was actually older than me. When I was in the Navy, I remember, for a few years. And it took me a while to figure out, but you could not compliment her. You could not say anything nice. She just could not handle it. I mean, it was the strangest thing. And I, I pray she found peace later in life. But, she, but one day she told me her story. And that didn't fit in her world. It had been nothing but abuse. And she just could not take a compliment. It was, it was interesting, but so painful to watch. God loves you. He's a good, good father. And with that in mind, we have to understand that he's going to do things in a good way. And part of that's being kind. How kind was he? He was kind enough to go to the cross and you didn't have to. That's amazingly kind. And a whole lot of other words that I could add. But he does it through his kindness. He leads us to repentance because his grace is so exquisite that we would just want to come back. To be treated like that. To be loved like that. So the covenant with God that David had was based on God's obviously it wasn't David it's not about ours even so David knew that obedience still mattered David says here the sons of rebellion shall all be as thorns thrust away so God would still oppose the sons of rebellion and they would end in ruin it's always been a promise that God would deal with the wicked and he will and he has and he'll end that someday David knew he could trust the Lord to take care of his enemies and wicked men. He had some times, and you can read about it in his Psalms, where he thought, where are you, Lord? How long are you going to wait before you deal with these wicked? But he always, they always did, which is why David's Psalms are so special, because he starts off just completely honest about his relationship with God. Like, where are you? Why is this taking so long? You have no idea what I'm going through. You know, he lays it out honest with God and then you see you 
you see the entire process of God speaking to him. Because then he comes out of that having confessed it, repented of his thinking, even if he doesn't say it there, and then he ends his psalm praising God. What a beautiful picture. God says, come to the throne boldly, speak your heart to me, remember who you're speaking to, I want to add that in, and then just listen. Let him speak, let him deal with your heart. Then you go out the room praising him, because he's accepted you, he's reminded you. Listen to another quote by a different old-time commentator. He said, this was the whole theme of David. The Lord is in control. Rest in him. Don't fret yourself because of the evildoers that bring evil devices to pass. Rest in the Lord. Trust also in him. Delight thyself in the Lord. And all of the help and the strength, the ministry of God's spirit to our hearts, through the Psalms, the sweet psalmist of Israel, what a legacy he has left. And he has. You know, every one of us, and I don't know if that's a goal of yours, it's never really been a goal of mine, but, but in a sense, we all get to leave a legacy in this life, in serving the Lord, in loving the Lord. And, and that legacy may be better termed by testimony. Our testimony is our legacy of how things have gone with the Lord and the great things that he's done in us and with us, and through us. I mean, when you think about it, David's relationship with God was remarkable. And it's the reason why David was Israel's greatest king and the most prominent ancestor of Jesus Christ. The New Testament begins with these words. And as stated earlier, the, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. That's how the New Testament begins. Jesus being the son of David. I mean, how much did God love him? And how much did God have grace on him and mercy on him? forgiveness for him. Why? Say it again. David always turned. David's heart was always for God. If you haven't understood yet, I'm trying to drill that into us. Us, not just you, us. That his love is that great. The first seven verses of this chapter that we covered tonight, it's just the beautiful last words of David, it tells us. And these last words of David are very much inspired it's, it's a song. It's a psalm. You know, at least 73 of the 150 psalms in the book of Psalms were written by David. At least 73. It's almost half or maybe half. This one that we just read tonight is only found in 2 Samuel. But it's indeed a psalm. It's indeed a psalm. It's, it's David's last words and how else would he speak but in psalm. In these verses, David really describes the ideal ruler, the Messiah whose reign shall be a glorious dawn, a morning without clouds after a long stormy night. David realized that he did not fit the description, but he took comfort in the fact that God's covenant assured him that the Messiah would be descended from him. And I really thought about that as I came to that, and it's really the close for tonight. And, and then I thought a little bit about that last statement after I typed it out. I'm just going to read it again. David realized that he did not fit the description, but he took comfort in the fact that God's covenant assured him that the Messiah would be descended from him. You know, when I think of myself, and I'll just use myself as an example, and I, I think of my life, my, my, my true life, my thought life, where my heart lies, you know, things that you guys don't see. I, I mean, and I think what God probably wants for me and what, he, what he'd like to see I, I probably with David would say I don't fit the description but you know what whatever comes from my life for his sake because of his spirit it's going to fit the description because that's him coming through me and it works the same way for every one of us if we evaluate what might come from God through us to this world in line with what we see in ourselves, then we're getting things crossways. Whatever comes through me from God is from God. And it can't be anything but good. And I can't evaluate that or stop that, filter that, or refuse that because of what I see in 
I'm not going to necessarily fit the description of, of, of just really what God wants for me, although I'd love to, and I probably have moments. But man, I've got a full confidence that if I let myself be a conduit for His Spirit, that living water coming through me, then it's going to be exactly what God wants it to be. It's going to be exactly how God has described it because it had nothing to do with the person it came. I just was available. And that's really what he wants from us, to be in his presence, to be in a place of, 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 of repentance, meaning we, we've dealt with whatever's in our lives so that he can work with us, so that he can use us, and that he can put his stamp on the world, people around us. And it'll look exactly how he wants it to look. He did it through David. And we've seen the great sin of David. So I just think it's a, just a great, I think it's just a great invite into the presence of God. And I think it's a great contemplation of God's love for us. I think it's a great cause once again, which really should be a daily chore to consider his grace, his mercy. And then that incomprehensible love that he has. Indescribable. Indescribable. We are so blessed. So blessed. So we'll rest there. Uh, we'll probably finish up next week.